Welcome. We're uh, glad to bring you into our apparent conversation here. Uh, but it's really, we're very excited to have you here. Uh, this is our weekly time to focus on resilience and resilient church leadership. Today, we're doing part two of a series that we started last week around the critical moments, recognizing we're at the six month mark of our what the whole world has been through, and particularly us uh, here uh, in the US, and maybe those of you listening elsewhere, um, everyone's been in on this. And then really, the world has just been under one series of difficulties, and especially those in church leadership, uh, one after another during these last six months. So last week, we focused on a little bit of that. And this week, we're going to be uh, talking around this critical moment about how do we live? How do we live? What is the forward going motion uh, as we're among these dry bones of the rest of our culture, or maybe the people in our churches, even our own families? So uh, just again, want to welcome you to Backstage. That's what this whole pod, or podcast webinar is all about, is focusing on the back part of our life that deeply impacts who we are on the front stage of our life and leadership. We hope this will serve you and uh, your team as we focus on the soul and your resiliency. So a um, couple housekeeping things. We will always be receiving uh, questions on chat if you're in on the Zoom call or on Facebook Live if you happen to be there. And if you are on Facebook, guys, we really uh, would love for you to share this out to your network. We wanna be able to serve as many leaders as we possibly can. And uh, by way of introductions, I'm Mindy Caliguire and I serve on the strategy group for our resilientchurchleadership.com initiative uh, within the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton. And I also uh, work at GLUE in senior leadership and am uh, leading an organization called Soul Care. Um, but today we will be joined by two additional strategy group team members, uh, organizational psychologist, uh, Dr. Margaret Didams, who is a principal consultant with the Didams Group, and our premier pastor's pastor, Jimmy Dodd, who leads Pastor Serve. So welcome, guys. Glad you're here with us today. Thanks, Mindy. Thanks, Mindy. Great to be on with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I just want so, to say when we were together yeah. two weeks ago, I was uh, just boarding a train uh, for Seattle. It was great doing it from Chicago Union Station and having all the announcements. I do want to say I got back from uh, Seattle safely a couple of days ago, and I wanted just a shout out to our brothers and sisters on the West Coast mm -hmm. uh, who are just even having the difficulty of breathing. So wow. we are in prayer for you, praying as the hopefully the smoke uh, dissipates this weekend, but also those who are uh, more even directly impacted by the fires, our, our prayers are out there for you. Mm, yeah, really Amen. good words. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so again, as I said, today we're going to be looking at part two of this critical moment that we are all in, and I believe uh, this week actually does mark the six-month uh, threshold for us as, uh, as a nation. And so, Jimmy, I wonder if you would kind of tee us off a little bit on um, what we what were some of the highlights of what we covered last week, just to bring everybody up to speed in case they weren't there. But then yeah. more importantly, like, how has this conversation advanced for you even just in the last week? Yeah, I guess it's a great question. And yeah, you know what, it's a very, very important time because it's been six months. Mm -hmm. And six months is that time in which I think there's more and more of that, you know what, what we're doing, it's been good, but it's just not sustainable. You know, that there's that point in which you work so hard and you have to make so many big, big decisions. You have to shift constantly. And there's there's that point where you just have to understand uh, what we have been doing has been good, but this is not actually sustainable. It's like a marathon, right? So it's like I'm you get it's like you start off in a marathon, and 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 I mean like if you start off in a sprint, you're thinking, hey, you might be in first place for a while, and you might be able. I mean, you might be so good, you might go, you know, three or four miles of a sprint, but you, but this is not sustainable. Your pace is not sustainable. And I think that there's more and more pastors right now saying, all right, I'm starting to hit a wall in a big way. I mean, a mm -hmm. big wall where we are starting to see more and more depression, more and more questions of just, I just can't go on this way because God did not make you to go on this way. But it's just that, um, it's just that point of six months, which we've watched over the years in lots and you know, lots and lots of natural disasters that there's something about that six month point of 
well, you know what, I want to be in the very front, front, you know, front of like the line to serve and to help, but I want to be at the back of the line to actually receive help. And there's that point in which you've got to receive some help. You've got to just stop and say, my soul, my life and my family, we need some care. We, we you know, we, we have to have some help. It's not selfish. It's just wise. Uh, but yeah, there are more and more pastors. So I have heard things this week that have caused me just really some big, big concern. I mean, things like, man, you know what? I can't get out of bed. I mean, I cannot get You're out hearing of bed. that from pastors. Y- yes. Yes. Which, which, which is just obvious depression. It's like, they're, yeah. they're just so down and they're, they've just given, 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 and their tanks have not been filled. And after a while, they're just depleted, which right. is not surprising. It's like, you can't constantly give out. And there's that point in which, yes, we are, we, we are, you know, we're, we're in this very hard, you know, very hard, hard time. Yes. There's those things you have to do to serve your church in ways that might be, I mean, like extremely different, but, but that pace cannot go on forever. And so a lot of pastors have hit a wall and, and I mean, in, 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 in a very big way where they feel like, and I can't go on. I just Jimmy- cannot go on. Just a quick question on that. Do you also hear from them or about how the people in their congregation are hitting a wall? Because it seems to me that the the challenges are being faced not only by our leaders, but also by us as congregants. And yes, what is everybody. the cumulative? Oh, yeah. yeah. What, how oh, is yeah. that? How is that showing up for the leaders? Oh, 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 oh my gosh. As far as big, big issues, as far as mental health, I, I mean, mm-hmm. we, we are in a mental health crisis right now as a nation, I believe, which, which we'll hear, I think, a lot more about. I, I mean, like, obviously, from Margaret, she, yeah. she's like the expert in this. But yes, it, it is a mental health crisis right now in America, uh, be, be, because I think everybody's at that point of, okay, it was kind of, it, it's been hard, but it's been actually survivable. But now they're at the point of, okay, I, I cannot go on any longer. This, this is mm-hmm. just not working for me. And everybody's like, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to actually escape this. I don't know how to get just some sense of relief. And there, 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 there's a lot of questions right now. So there is fear yeah. all throughout the church. There's no question. Yes, yes. and I, I think that often gets translated into a sense of we just lose hope. Like I was mm. hoping this yeah. would change or I was hoping this would change or I hoped this would happen or you know, those, that, that aching question that, that the disciples on the road to Emmaus said to Jesus, you know, but we had hoped, yeah. we had hoped. And hope is, I often say, is feels like one of the most dangerous things in the world. Like, what are you, what is your hope in? And, and when our hope is deferred, you know, our hearts literally and our minds and our bodies, I think, grow sick. So before we dive into Margaret's work, I wonder, Jimmy, there's a passage that the, the three of us had talked about ahead of time. And I thought just to sort of frame and, and bring our imagination forward um, into where does all this collective pain intersect the presence of the living God and us in the middle of all that. So I wondered if you would read uh, read that passage, guide us yeah, through so, it. So yeah, right right now we are we are very much in the midst of a lot of dry bones. I mean, we mm. are in the midst of a valley of dry bones. And it is, I mean, it is a hard time. Um, but I think that we have to find more and more of those ways to just actually refresh our soul. So, you know, when I want this passage to just refresh your soul. So I would just ask you, just, just take some time and mm. just kind of get loose a little bit. And you might just actually close your eyes and just hear this powerful story of God's word, the Valley of Dry Bones, um, because it speaks to us in a deep way. It says this, Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he sent me down in a valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around amongst them, and behold, there were very, very many all over the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, 
Oh, Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to also be upon you and you will have skin and put breath in you and you will live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied this, I was told. And as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, there was a rattling and the bones came all together, bone to bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews upon them and flesh upon them and skin was all over them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said, said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came in to them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open up your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. What an amazing, powerful promise. Amen. Thank you. Hmm. What a gift. I just want to sit in that imagery yeah. and that promise. That's beautiful. Oh, well, Margaret, um, you've done a lot of research, a lot of thinking and writing about how leaders come back to life. Mm -hmm. And right. that that's not just like a in, in your head thing. It's a very integrated reality. Maybe start right. helping us understand who's, who are we? Who's coming to life? What are, right. What's happening here? So what we want to, thank you, Mindy, what we want to focus on today is just kind of some bare bones, basics, physiology. I'm really happy that Jimmy started with the, the uh, metaphor of a marathon. We didn't talk about that as our, our pre uh, conversation. So I'm, it's a God sighting that you threw that out, Jimmy, because what you said was people are hitting uh, a wall and that is not just figuratively, it is what is happening with people's bodies. And so I wanna take a little bit of time to talk about what is the physiology that is leading to that feeling of hitting the wall that is so similar to uh, running a marathon. By the way, I have been crazy enough in my life to run a couple marathons. And, and so when we like to say the marathon begins at mile 20, it's those last six miles that really make it a, a marathon, as it were. The first 20 is just play. Be, because your physiology is changing when you get to that mile 20, and that's what's called hitting the wall. We are at a place after six months where our physiology is matching what happens to a marathon runner at mile 20. Now it's acute after two, three, four hours when you're a marathon runner, but it's still cumulative. And if you think about it, we have that accumulation over these six months of what a runner might experience in two to four hours. So I wanna walk through 
what's happening to people's bodies. Why am I feeling uh, the way that I am feeling? The first thing I want to say about that, I also asked the Mindy and, and Jimmy, if I get too academic, they're supposed to pull me back. And <laughs> Stop, stop with that. Here's, here's the number one thing I want you to understand is your brain is your body. There is not a situation where your brain is up here and the rest is your body. Your brain is uh, basically, it's made up of three, I'm being really gross about this. Those of you who know neuroscience, I apologize, but I want you to think about the brain as three aspects. There's the frontal lobe. That is where we do our, our higher level thinking. There's the cerebellum, which is in the back of, of the brain. We often refer to that as the reptilian part of our brain, but that is where we have our, um, what takes care of our, our breathing, our heart rate. It's uh, the part of our brain that just keeps, uh, it doesn't need thinking, it's, it just does what it does. And then there's the limbic system, which is in between. And we wanna think about this limbic system as the switching, to, to use a train, it's the switch yard. So um, what happens is your, your brain continues down into this, this little tab at the bottom that looks like a finger. That is the central nervous system. So the brain continues. The brain continues into your central nervous system, which goes down your spine, and then it branches off and it branches off into what's known as the peripheral nervous system. And that's, uh, for example, when you feel tingling in your arms and your legs, that's the uh, peripheral nervous system working. And then there's another nervous system, which is called the entric nervous system that's connected to this. And the entric, if you think about the old uh, biblical terms of entrails, that's your gut. You actually, your brain is in your gut. Those of you who, Sometimes think you think with your gut, you actually do. There, there is part of the nervous system. So if you ever find yourself in a stressful situation and you get stomach cramps, that's the entric nervous system working. So we don't separate our, our brain somehow from the rest of our body. We need to think about the brain being that uh, just embodied and that we have this amygdala in the center that takes in perceptions and decides whether to send it, send any perception to the frontal lobe for us to think about, or does it send it to the uh, cerebellum and down the central nervous system? So let me give you an example of this. I almost had a head-on uh, car collision a, a decade ago. Um, car spun out in front of me as I was going uh, down uh, the highway and I had a split second to avoid that head-on collision. What happened with that, if you work with me, is that my eyes perceived a car coming at me. Now, here's the important thing is we don't see with our eyes, we don't hear with our ears, we see and hear with our brain. The eyes just communicate into this limbic system. Your ears just send um, information, again, perception into the uh, amygdala, the limbic system, and then the limbic system translates it. Okay, so when I almost had this head on uh, car collision, nothing went to the frontal lobe. My, my amygdala sent it directly down the central nervous system to my, to my foot, mm. basically, without me having to think. So I was able to slam on the brakes fast enough so that I did not hit this car. So what happens under chronic stress, as we're taking things in, the, um, the amygdala tends to circumvent the frontal lobe and just sends things down to our rest of our, our body because it's sensing danger. So a stressor is considered, as we take it in, again, through our eyes, through our ears, um, our body is seeing that something is different than normal 
and is reacting through it by not having us think, but having us do. And that doing is often just magnifying uh, e uh, emotion and energy. So that's why you actually wear out. The brain is wearing out your body because the brain is thinking there's danger here. Hmm. Hmm. Now, what usually happens in regular day-to-day um, -day activity, the brain actually knows to send things to the um, front of the, the brain. And the, the brain basically says, it's not that bad. Oh. <laughs> the frontal lobe. So we want to think of the amygdala as this like blunt hammer, danger. Those of us who are from the 60s, danger, Will Robinson, danger, danger. <sighs> and and that, that quick reaction. If it's just kind of normal day to day, the amygdala will also send things to the the frontal lobe and then the frontal lobe is like your grandmother it says oh you know we've we've experienced this before it's not that bad just calm down what right? a great metaphor <laughs> yeah and Good. and but the thing is when you haven't experienced something before and it's going right down the central nervous system the frontal lobe is not involved in saying it's not that bad. So what, what's happening as we pile on these new experiences, the frontal lobe has no experience with them and is not able to do its job, as it were. And so you'll hear people say right now, you know, I have a fuzzy brain or I have COVID brain or I'm not thinking straight or I'm tired. And, and that is true perceptions are not getting to the frontal lobe wow. to, in a sense, tell people that it's okay. And somewhat even worse is that the stuff that does get to the frontal lobe, in a sense, we're, we're running into neurological ruts. And this is what rumination is. We're thinking the same thoughts over and over and over again because we're not having cognitive complexity. So those of you, you're probably finding yourself thinking about similar things over and over again and kind of problem solving in a very narrow window. And that's mm. the, the brain in a sense, the, is your brain and body, again, connected, are overwhelmed. And the brain, mm. whose major function is to keep you alive, is trying to cut down on all the signals that are coming in. So what we want to be doing during this time, the six months, is to try to calm down the amygdala so that it's not sending everything down the central nervous system. And by the way, I suspect there's a lot of pastors out there who are, are having uh, stomach pains, gut pains, and they don't understand why. Hmm. It's the entric nervous system is ramped up. You may be waking up at 4 a.m. and your arms are tingling. Hmm. That's the peripheral nervous system. Really? So, yeah. So all of your bodily reactions are coming from the, your brain and the amygdala, sending it down the cerebellum and the central nervous system. Wow. So those, those, these are all markers of the brain basically saying, we don't know what's happening. This is stress. We're getting the body ready for fight or flight. Wow. So it's really key at this time, after six months of this, again, it's like 20 miles of a marathon, same amount of stressors, or if not more. And what we need to do is get things into the frontal lobe so that it's not running down our, uh, in, into our body and creating the stressors. By the way, one of the ways I also want to mention that um, the body deals with stressors is the release of uh, neurotransmitters and um, also, sorry, that too, I didn't want to go there, but uh, hormones. And one of those hormones is cortisol. 
and cortisol. Those of you who have gotten cortisol shots, you know, it makes the pain go away. That's exactly what cortisol does. It's supposed to make pain go away because it's, it's a hormone that gets released through, through the, the brain and it's more complex than that. But what happens is it, it also cortisol will, um, the release of it wears you out and it can start to destroy organs. Wow. So it's supposed to be uh, just a short-term relief that's why if you have a doctor who says, I, I could give you a cortisol shot, I don't know if that's really good be, because of this long-term wear and tear. But the point being is not only uh, the, the way that your brain is acting right now, it's releasing a lot of chemicals to kind of deal with that fight or flight. And that makes you tired. And so <sighs> Jimmy, when you say pastors don't, you know, people are sleeping more, Oh. And they don't want to get out of out of bed. Yep. Uh, again, part of that is our bodies are wearing ourselves out because we're dealing with stress in a really uh, um, uh, what should be acute is now chronic and yeah. it's, yeah. it's not yeah. healthy ways. So that's some of the background. No, that was blah, blah, blah. That was like three weeks of lecturing on the brain. Any questions, guys? <laughs> Yeah, probably a so, billion. Okay, so, go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, so I mean, let's 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 go to just I mean, I'm to actually I mean, like the worst case scenario. So I mean, like if we just say I've just got to push through, I've just I've just got to push through. I can't change. I've got to push through. Then what what are the things that actually start to happen then? Yeah, and that's kind of what we're trained to do, right? Yeah. So, Especially as pastors, yes. So. What happens is there's a wonderful book. It's not written by Christians, I think, or, or for Christians, but it's called The Body Keeps the Score. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you yeah. can try to mentally push through, but it's not going to happen because your body is reacting in ways that are, are dysfunctional, hmm. right? So you're getting narrow focus and thought, um, you're exhausted, um, you're not being able to self-regulate. And part of that self-regulation is relationships. And so you're probably being testy at the best and blowing up at people who you love. And you're like, whoa, where did that come from? That feeling of, whoa, where did that come from? That's your amygdala trying to protect you. Mm. Uh, we had a family dog who, um, used to nip at uh, people. And I, and I wanted to say, he's scared of you. He's attacking because he's scared of you. So that's, that's what's happening in our relationships is our, our body is trying to protect itself. And, and so we're nipping at people as a form of self-protection because we're not engaging our frontal lobe. So that's another signal is if I'm being testy with people, that's an example of two, uh, my body is, ex is just really stressed out. Mm -hmm. If you're having those moments of where did that come from? Sounds so like well. those are some of the markers. Um, and uh, any, any questions, Mindy? Oh, Before I was I just thinking, to, it sounds we, like, how, how do we get back into our head? How do we get Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. I was just thinking that it sounds like the nippy dog needs to have a visit to grandma. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All going to be okay. We've been here before. The dog down. Exactly. Right. <laughs> um, no, but Margaret, that's really helpful. You're saying things. I feel like I've heard reptile brain. I've heard the gut brain. I've heard these, you know, some from Christian sources, some from just sort of general pop culture. But this is really lovely to hear it from you uh, based on, you know, all the, the findings of how truly fearfully and wonderfully made we are, but how we need to honor that. We need to live within the constraints of how we're made, not keep pushing beyond in ways that are unhealthy, like a marathon runner that says, I don't need the rest stop. I don't need this. I don't need this. And I, I guess I am curious about that hitting the wall thing. Like what happens physiologically to a runner when they hit that wall? It's also what happens with stress is uh, not only do you have a rush of 
of hormones happening, but um, you run out of what we call glycogen. Glycogen okay. is basically uh, the food, how food gets turned into food that our body can use. Hmm. And so glycogen just goes away and um, we're basically starving our brains um, wow. with that. So that can, can happen with chronic stress where we're, and that's why people say you need to eat well, you need to sleep, you need to exercise. I, I mm. can't say that uh, enough about dealing with the stressors, how important it is to do self care at these times. But that is self care in, but it's not dealing with the root cause. Mm. And, and I get really frustrated with people in who talk about, oh, you know, um, go for a walk, go, you know, um, do something else, do, do yoga, which I will, whatever. Um, just, you know, eat well, sleep right. But that's not dealing with the root cause of mm. the stressors. And it tends to just, it's just helping you not flood your body with uh, cortisol mm. and, and hormones, but it's not dealing with what is the issue that's causing that flooding to be to begin with. And I think that's what you all were talking about earlier about hope is pastors are not seeing, it's the way to kind of think about it is the present is separated from the past and unrelated to the future. We don't know what the future holds. And so every action right now is kind of doubled down with, but what does this mean for the future? Mm -hmm. So anything right now, think about this is frontal lobe stuff again. The frontal lobe helps us make sense of situations because it has experienced something in the past and says it's going to be okay. What's happening is the frontal lobe has no experience, which, which to tell us to calm down and we don't know what the future is. So that is why people are having difficult times uh, right now. It's just physiology. And if we don't address the physiological issues of, of what's coming in, then people's health uh, is going to continue to be impacted. And by the way, I just want to say right now, we tend to say health, mental health, as a psychologist, health is health. They're mm. not different. And that's what I want people to hear. Mental health is not a weakness. We don't think of when we have physical problems that there's something wrong with us for having a physical problem. So when we think about that kind of mental health, we need to think about it in terms of it's just health. Mm -hmm. our, our brain is our body. It's just health. And we need to have a holistic approach to how we deal with what our health issues right now. That's really important, isn't it? That's mm. good. Wow. That's a lot. That's powerful. A bit about how to get people back into their brain. Into the I would part love to brain. hear where do we where yeah, do we yeah, go? That's the whole thing. This okay, is, this is this is fascinating. Let's get to yeah. Let's get some <laughs> solutions, Margaret. We're dying here. Because it, it just sounds like, oh my gosh, why am I getting out of well, bed? It doesn't seem like that condition that the amygdala reacts to is going to change, right? It's not going to happen that in the next six months, the next six months, that we're going to encounter something that our grandmother brain needs, knows, okay, we've been here before. We know how to do this. Right. We're not going to hit that. And we don't, we, we can't keep in the cortisol flooding everything else mode so what do we do so if you've watched up until now don't leave us now don't, don't leave don't, now. do not you leave us do now you want, yeah, i'm you, not leaving because i want to hear this you will leave, you will leave <laughs> hopeless we there, there's got to be some hope here so here comes the good stuff so turn oh good don't walk away all right margaret so uh one thing I want people to understand, I'm going to give some, some general categories, but I want everyone here who's listening, who's 
feeling this mm. kind of overwhelmness is to think of it as my health. And just like we would go to a doctor, I want you to know that it's okay to mm. go to someone who deals with mental health type issues. It's just health. So I'm, I'm going to talk about some things you can do, but if you want more of this, I want to encourage you to go ahead and talk with a counselor, um, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. It's all right. It's health. Okay. Yes. Good. So let, let's talk about how we might calm down the brain as it were, so that more stuff goes to the frontal lobe. I want you all uh, who, are, who are watching us today, I want you to do a little assessment. And what I want you to do is your favorite um, podcast, pastor, um, whatever you tend to listen to, I want you to go ahead and, and listen to that. And I want you to set a timer for two minutes. And I want you to see if you can pay total attention for two minutes to whatever it is that you're listening to or watching. Because what is happening in this ramped up time is that our, our brain is, is so busy, again, that's not coming to the frontal lobe. If you can't pay attention for two minutes, then you are probably too ramped up. So that's just a good kind of your own little assessment. How am I doing? Can I spend two minutes? If you can spend two minutes, then I, I want you to see if you can do it for five minutes and then see if you can do it for 10 minutes, just paying total attention. What I'd like for everyone to be able to do in kind of a healthy place is that you could actually go for five minutes focused. If you can't get to five minutes, probably you need to be making some adjustments in your life. So I just want that simple uh, mm. assessment. Then uh, what we want to kind of be doing actually is exercising the frontal lobe. We want to start in, engaging it more. So we want, we want to do some exercises where we are, in a sense, slowing down the amygdala and getting things up to the frontal lobe. So what I want to recommend is uh, twice a day, you set a reminder. I have mine for 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. And there's two things I do at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. The first is the, the message on my uh, phone is pray. So I take time, focus time at nine and three to pray and also to check in, in a sense, with my body. So what are the stressors? How am I feeling? How is my body literally feeling? Is it tense, relaxed, and just take some time to engage my frontal lobe hmm. in thinking about what is happening with my body. And when I think about what is happening with my body, it's not just only thoughts. So what am, what am I thinking? Am I ruminating? Am I thinking at all? What emotions am I experiencing? And, and, and just, again, just the brain is so on automatic pilot is it helps for us to just calm down and, and in a sense of think, okay, what, are, what is the emotions that I'm having right now? And then how has my behavior been? So am I, <laughs> am I being open to other people or am I being that testy thing? <laughs> now, um, Jimmy, yesterday we, folks, we have a, a pre-talk conversation, so we're not totally winging this, but yesterday we talked about the idea about uh, fear and how in as Christians, we're not supposed to uh, experience fear be, because we have the Lord. Here's what I want you to think about with, with fear is that's a human label mm -hmm. to an emotion, right? So we don't experience 
fear, what we experience, and this is again from the brain, what's coming in from our senses, we're experiencing unknown. And we're experiencing a way that we, we, we haven't had a prior experience. Hmm. So the frontal lobe doesn't know how to deal with things. So it comes out as, I don't know what to do with this. And we label that as fear. And then we all, then we go to real dark places. But in this time of uh, just self-reflection, if we feel fear, what we've labeled fear, what is driving that? So what have I experienced that's ambiguous? Hmm. A lot of times when we think about fear, it's often relational. I don't know how to interact with someone because something new has come up, hmm. right? So fear, the, the concept of fear is an, an amygdala sort of thing. It's a reptilian brain. What we wanna do is we wanna break that down to figure out, figure out what it is that is causing that emotional response and can I bring it up to the frontal lobe to, un, to try to unpack that? And here's where being able to talk with someone who has experience with these sorts of things becomes really important to partner with someone who can help you to unpack that. So that's the first thing is how are you getting through the day? What are your thoughts, emotions, and behavior? And do that nine o'clock, three o'clock check. Mm. You might remember from two weeks ago, I talked about... We have a lot more energy, physical energy in the morning. So do your hard decisions, have your team meeting in the morning and 3 p.m. is a good check-in because you're kind of in that worn out state, but you mm. probably still have hours of work to do. So mm. that afternoon break becomes really, really uh, important. Mm. Then the second mm. thing I want people to do is check in with your important relationships. Are you, who is your support system and who are you supporting? And how are those relationships going? Because that's another real marker for um, that kind of worn out aspect. By the way, I wanna, I wanna be really clear right now. If you're feeling really flooded um, with stressors, um, it's, <laughs> It's not a shameful thing. It's, this, is, this is the way your brain is made. And as things become uh, more unknown, the brain is just trying to keep you alive. There's, there's no shame in it. There's no shame when I almost got into that head-on collision that my brain sent information to my foot and it didn't go through <laughs> my, my frontal lobe. I'm, I'm good with that, right? That it's just the way the body is reacting. So uh, we just want to work on, again, cal calming that down and bringing it more to the forefront. So how are your important relationships and who's giving you support as you give support? And then as you are processing this six month window, what do you keep coming back to? Are you... So an example of rumination is has someone who's also testy and like i'm sorry but who's not testy right now okay is someone on your last nerves in a way that they would not have been six months ago okay that that is a sign of again this kind of rut thinking if I keep coming back to something. So if I keep coming back to something and it doesn't feel like I'm solving it or moving forward with that relationship, that's probably another good marker of needing uh, to be able to talk with someone. The way I like to think about uh, this is it's like spaghetti that you cook and then you don't quite serve right away and it gets all knotted up and you can't get it unknotted. A lot of what happens with stressors as you can think about this as we're just kind of in this spaghetti knot and we, we need people who have mm. trained to help us un, unwiggle the spaghetti as it were. Again, nothing wrong about that. Then the fourth thing 
I want to be more positive about this. What are you learning about this time uh, about your organization and about yourself? Because here's what's really interesting about um, leadership and, and how leaders learn. Leaders learn best on the job. So uh, go to as many uh, offsites training as you want. But when you think about as a leader, what have been uh, those points of learning? They've been stress moments. So yeah. as awful as these six months have been, they're also an incredible time for us to learn about our strengths, for us to learn about what we do well, for us to learn about where our team has come through in clutch moments. And even though there's this testiness, is where is it that we work really well together? Hmm. So there is kind of this- I love those. Is, is this is a growth opportunity. Um, I just to use the, the marathon uh, metaphor a little bit more, I, every time that I've run a marathon, I have feel, I have felt God's presence in those last two miles because I'm stripped of everything. I am stripped of everything. And it feels like I have come to the throne. Wow with nothing. And I am, I am ready to be open uh, to the Lord. And so with my friends, I joke, I joke, really, God, I have to run a marathon. I have to get to mile 24. But, but for me, that, that is where I have met the Lord deeply. Mm, that's beautiful. So, so if we can also think about this time as uh, just being stripped of so much, but then how we, that we have this opportunity to bring ourselves uh, to the Lord in ways that we, mm. we have as we rely on our own understanding. Mm. Margaret, I love the nature of the questions you've given us to reflect on. And it makes me think of, you know, how many times over many, many years when I have been not actually running a marathon, but feeling sort of at the end of my reserves, feeling at the end of whatever I had to offer a particular situation or leadership challenge or relationship. And in the pages, what felt like a non-judgmental pages of a journal to be able to go, go back and, and reflect on, I think some of the questions like that you've been, you've been causing us to think on, like, what are my thoughts? Like thinking about my thinking, like what, what is going on in my head? How am I present with people or not? And what is going on in those key relationships? And there was a third one too, I'm missing, but the thought that it would be valuable to reflect as an individual and as a team back on these last six months, like we all know the parts that are hard and confusing but like where have we come together and really crushed it where where was a moment and even if it was short-lived and it, we had to undo it three weeks later when did we come together and function well as a team uh, I just love that that could focus because sometimes we can just only be processing the hard stuff and there's value in that, especially if we then talk, oh, that was the other thing, who am I talking to about this? Mm -hmm. um, but having that sort of, you know, we've used that term appreciative inquiry, like where, where am I observing what has happened and without judgment, but especially noticing like where, where did we actually communicate well and work well and come up with a problem, a solution to a problem well? have what examples in like org your work with organizations and stuff like that maybe could help us understand what that reflection as a team could look like because I think that's a really practical thing that we could all do right so um two two things I want to say is use paper and pencil because you cannot write as fast as your brain processes it slows things down that's powerful so you really do want a journal with paper and, and pencil. Um, and those are those four uh, questions that I, I mentioned. Let's talk about teams. So uh, we talked about dry bones and uh, what um, 
I've used with industry when I worked at Microsoft was we always talked about postmortems, which I don't know that that goes well with um, Ezekiel 37, but um, when whenever we're working on a, a, a project or something uh, process where we've accomplished something is it's always important pretty soon afterwards to go back and say, how did that go? What, what did we learn from that? So I like to use the phrase lessons learned. What were the lessons learned? And those lessons learned can be good, cheer ourselves on, or what did we learn that we can do better? And you remember from two weeks ago, I said, no, no right, wrong, because we don't have enough information right now. We're mm -hmm. making good decisions or better decisions. So uh, not only was when we do postmortems, not only the outcome, but what was the process? Mm -hmm. How did we come? How did we work together? Mm -hmm. How did we listen to each other? Uh, in, in a way, again, many of you talked about appreciative inquiry. In, in a way, we want to be <clears throat> observing ourselves and, and not in a judgmental way. So as a, as a team, so we're not pointing fingers, but what were the team dynamics uh, around that? And, and I can't begin to say enough how important it is when you're working together as a team that you're thinking in terms of the team dynamic, not pointing fingers to an individual. So that as a, as a leader, you wanna make sure that it stays at the, how, how is it that we're working together as a team? Does every, are we creating a system where everyone feels that they can contribute? Jimmy, a couple of weeks ago, you talked about pastors who are closer in age to us, right. who are feeling like, my job security is on the line if I speak up, even though I have 30 years of experience. Right. So what are the team dynamics that might be happening that's not allowing everyone to speak? So you want to be speaking into the team, not pointing fingers right Good. now. And, and what are the lessons learned around that? Hmm. Well, that's really great encouragement, really specific ways that we hope will serve you as you're serving uh, your ministry or commitments to family and even just to yourself, that there are ways we think of, I think of them as ways to care for your soul, but Margaret has much smarter ways to talk about it than that. But you can do this. You can grab a journal, write down, even if you just burn the thing or like write things down and, and throw them away. But the value of writing it down is incredibly important as you honor the processes of how God's wired your brain. And um, so I, I hope that our time here today has been helpful to you. Uh, we really want to continue to encourage you to reach out and find people to talk with as you're going through these difficult times. Uh, one of the biggest things we want probably to do when we're struggling or in pain is we want to isolate and to move that into the opposite direction for the sake of all the things that you're called to, the sake of the well-being of your own soul, um, to start maybe in the safety of a journal, but then maybe bring some of those questions that you're reflecting on, uh, which I think we can include those in the show notes in case anybody's wondering what those specific questions were, that way you'll have them. And then, uh, yeah, bring it out into community, bring it before God, uh, bring it to your own self-awareness. Those are really good next steps for you in this, your soul care. And um, yeah, so we, we're just excited to have been with you. We wanna thank you for joining us today on the backstage and the resources available to you on the resilientchurchleadership.com are really important. So you'll learn more about Jimmy's organization and some of the services that he has coaches all over the country who will offer uh, some complimentary sessions for you, even as you're in the midst of a really hard time. Those pastor serve coaches can be really, really helpful to you. Soul Care has some coaches and spiritual directors who similarly are able to help you with that. Uh, Margaret's organization is available as a resource and can be extremely important as you are looking not only at your own well-being, but the well-being of your organization. 
And as you can tell, she's a renowned expert in these things and uh, well able to journey with you uh, as you move through the seasons. But more than anything else, we hope you hear from us uh, and we share with you the same dependence on, on that God who breathes life into, into dry bones. And so if you're feeling a little dry, a little tired, um, it's your brain's been working really hard. Your whole body's been working hard. And, uh, and there is life in, in God. And so take good care, manage those emotions as they're coming in. And we'll see you next week on Backstage, a gift from Resilient Church Leadership. Have a great rest of your day, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Jimmy. Great to be with you both. Yep. Bye-bye.